Vasopressor management can be the difference between life and death in the ICU. If you take care of critically ill patients, these eight must-know facts will help you make the right call when it matters most. Let's dive in. Let's start with the first fact. Fact number one, vasopressors won't work in a dry tank. Vasopressors are ineffective in volume depleted patients. Before reaching for pressors, always ensure adequate volume resuscitation. If hypotension persists despite fluid, with, then and only then consider vasopressors. And for most patients, to make it easy, an initial resuscitation with two to three liters of crystalloid, preferably a balanced solutions like LR or plasmalite, is sufficient. Beware of post-intubation shock in volume depleted patients. Volume depleted patients are at high risk for profound hypotension after intubation. Positive pressure ventilation reduces venous return, worsening hypotension. The fix, of course, fluids, not vasopressors. Before we move to the next fact, if you would like to receive a summary of this video, kindly subscribe to my Substack. The link is provided below. Fact number two, not all vasopressors are created equal. As all of you know, blood pressure equal heart rate multiplies by times stroke volumes times systemic vascular resistance. This means vasopressors increases blood pressure by working to increase heart rate, chronotropic effect, increase stroke, stroke volume in the tropic effects, or by increasing systemic vascular resistance, vasoconstrictive effect. Effect. All vasopressors cause vasoconstrictions. In addition, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine have both chronotropic effect increase the heart rate and inotropic effects increases the stroke volume. While phenylephrine and midodrine are pure vasoconstrictors. On the other hand, vasopressin works differently. It increases systemic vascular resistance via V1 receptors and has no direct inotropic or chronotropic effects. Norepinephrine has a more potent vasoconstrictor effect than epinephrine and dopamine leading to increased systemic vascular resistance and this vasoconstriction can trigger reflex bradycardia similar to phenylephrine however norepinephrine also has beta 1 activity which counteracts this effect resulting in a stable or a mildly increased heart rate in contrast epinephrine and dopamine have stronger beta 1 mediated chronotropic effects making them more suitable for use in bradycardic patients. Let's move to fact number three. Norepinephrine is first line. Norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor for most types of shocks and hypotensions except in anaphylaxis and in anesthesia-induced hypotension. In anaphylactic shock, epinephrine is the first line treatment because it uniquely addresses all life-threatening aspects. The alpha-1 mediated vasoconstriction reverses hypotension and airway swelling. The beta-1 effect supports cardiac output and the beta-2 causes bronchodilation and inhibits mast cell degranulation. And no other vasopressor provides all these combination of effects. In anesthesia-induced hypotension, phenylephrine is preferred unless cardiac output is impaired, in which case norepinephrine is a better choice. Vasopressin is an adjunct to norepinephrine to help reduce norepinephrine requirements and mitigate potential side effects. It's typically added when norepinephrine requirements exceed 0.25 to 0.5 mcg per kg per minute or around 5 to 15 mcg or actually 10 to 15 mcg per minute in a 70 kilo patients. However, it's primarily studied in septic shock, but it can still be used where norepinephrine is used. Epinephrine is the third vasopressor to add, except in anaphylaxis as we explained where it is considered a first line. Besides anesthesia-induced hypotension, phenylephrine is also used when norepinephrine leads to excessive tachycardia. Dopamine is no longer a preferred vasopressor due to its higher risk of tachyarrhythmias, increased mortality in septic shock, and unreliable pharmacodynamics with variable receptor effects based on uh, depending on the dose. While it may still be considered in bradycardic shocks or when norepinephrine is unavailable, epinephrine remains the preferred choice for bradycardic shock over dopamine due to its more potent and reliable beta-1 effect. Midodrine is the only commonly used oral vasopressors, which is mainly used in chronic hypotension and weaning of other vasopressors. More about weaning soon. Let's move to fact number four, 
mean arterial pressure or MAP should be targeted when titrating vasopressors in the ICU. When titrating vasopressors in a critically ill patients, the target mean arterial pressure or MAP is typically equal or above 65 millimeter Hg, as it is the best indicator of organ perfusion. Systolic blood pressure, on the other hand, should not be used as a target since it fluctuates due to various factors, examples, uh, pulse pressure variability, arrhythmias, mechanical ventilation, and does not reliably reflect tissue perfusion status. However, some patients may struggle to maintain a MAP of 65 or above due to chronically low diastolic blood pressure, even with high vasopressor doses or requirements. Remember that MAP is equal to systolic blood pressure plus two times diastolic blood pressure divided by three. In these cases, it is important to determine whether the low diastolic blood pressure is a baseline finding rather, rather than a sign of inadequate perfusion. Reviewing previous prior vital signs can help assess if the patient normally function at a lower MAP or mean arterial pressure without adverse effects. If the patient has a chronically low diastolic blood pressure but shows no signs of hypoperfusion, example normal mentation, normal urine output, and normal lactate levels, it may be reasonable to adjust the MAP target to 60 or even 55 millimeter Hg rather than unnecessarily escalating vasopressor doses. Fact number five, do not overlook steroids in refractory shock. Steroids play a crucial role in the management of refractory shock when patients remain hypotensive despite adequate fluid resuscitation and moderate to high dose vasopressors. Hydrocortisone is the preferred agent typically administered at 200 milligram per day given as 50 milligram IV every six hours. Treatment is usually continued for three to seven days or until vasopressors are discontinued with tapering considered if therapy exceeds one week. What do I mean by moderate to high dose vasopressor therapy? Moderate to high dose vasopressor therapy is defined as norepinephrine or epinephrine doses equal or more than 0.25 mics per kg per minute for at least four hours with high dose therapy the, uh, often exceeding one mix per kg per minute of norepinephrine equivalent. Let's move to fact number six, administer vasopressors via a central line whenever possible. Vasopressors should be infused through a central line whenever feasible to minimize the risk of extravasation and tissue injury. However, in emergencies, they may be initiated through a large bore peripheral IV while central access is being established. Central lines include both centrally inserted central catheters uh, like IJ or subclavian lines and peripherally inserted central catheters or what we call PIX lines as they terminate in the central circulations. Midline, however, should generally not be used for vasopressors due to their high risk of extravasation and inadequate hemodilution in the peripheral veins. Facts number seven, managing vasopressors extravasation if vasopressors infiltrate the surrounding tissue, immediately discontinue the infusion and initiate treatment to minimize tissue damage. The preferred antidote is fentolamine, an alpha adrenergic antagonist which can be injected subcutaneously around the affected area to counteract the vasoconstriction effect and prevent ne necrosis. Other options include topical nitroglycerin and in severe cases, hyaluronidase or local saline infiltration uh, can be used to promote drug dispersion. Let's move to the final fact, fact number eight, weaning vasopressors a stepwise approach. Vasopressor weaning should begin once the patient is clinically stable and the mean arterial pressure is at or above the target without ongoing signs of hypoperfusion. The general principle is to remove the vasopressor contributing the least to maintaining MAP first while keeping the most essential agents until last. Let's take an example. Consider a critically ill patient admitted with a severe septic shock. This patient was initially started on norepinephrine. As their condition worsened, vasopressin was added, followed by epinephrine and then phenylephrine for additional support. Now, this patient should receive steroid, of course. Now, the patient's condition has improved, let's assume, and we need to start the weaning process. 
vasopressors weaning sequence we start with removing phenylephrine first to, so phenylephrine is first to be discontinued because it was last added and least contribution second epinephrine second and unless significant cardiac support is still needed we remove it next and then vasopressin third typically we remove vasopressin when norepinephrine requirement is less than 0.25 mcg per kg per minute to avoid rebound hypotension and finally we remove norepinephrine last to be weaned as it is the primary agent maintaining perfusion i have some key considerations here wean one vasopressor at a time allowing around roughly four to six hours between changes to monitor for hypotension if map drops do not rush to restart the discontinued vasopressors and think or reconsider the weaning order or adjust the dose of the remaining vasopressors organ perfusion urine output mental status lactate clearance before further titrations so where is midodrine role in the weaning process Midodrine is not a replacement for IV vasopressor, but serve as a weaning aid in patients who are stable. Remember, stable to start with, but still requiring low dose pressor support. It can help transition patients out of the ICU faster while maintaining hemodynamic stability. For example, you have a patient who is recovering in the ICU, but continue to require a low dose norepinephrine. You can start midodrine, let's say 10 milligram PO every eight hours to help getting him off uh, norepinephrine and transition him or transfer him out of the ICU. In the end, if you found this video useful, kindly share it with your colleagues, give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so. To read a written summary of this video, kindly subscribe to my Substack page. The link is provided below. Thanks for watching and see you soon.